Good morning. I'm Rick Zimmerman with NCTA, the Internet and Television Association. We represent network innovators and content creators that have invested over $250 billion in private capital to build the world's most powerful technology platform. I'm a member of the IEF board and have had the um, pleasure of working with Jerry and Tim for nearly 20 years. It's my great pleasure and honor today to introduce Senator Brian Schatz of the great state of Hawaii. He is on several committees, but of greatest interest to us, he is the ranking member of the Subcommittee on Communications, Technology, Innovation, and the Internet within the Senate Commerce Committee. He's been a real champion for unlicensed spectrum and a leader on IoT, Internet of Things. Uh, today he will sit down with Margaret McGill, a tech reporter with, political, uh, with Politico Pro, and of course she is a pro in her own right. So if we could have Senator Schatz and Ms. McGill. Thank you, Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. All right. Um, let's get started by talking about what you'd like to see in terms of telecom policy out of Congress this year. What are some of your priorities? Well, I think the first thing is my, my mic's working? Okay. That's the first thing. That's a good start. Uh, uh, I think the first thing is to sort of recognize the change in administration is not your normal change in administration. The last three days have been eventful, to say the least. And, you know, people are, are processing what's happening uh, in their own minds and for their own companies and for their own families and communities. And that's important, and I've been participating as aggressively as I can in that aspect of a political sea change that just occurred. Uh, my great hope is that for telecom and the internet and communications that we essentially try to wall off um, these conversations from the inevitable partisan battles, uh, which I think are, by the way, not such a bad thing to have. Um, but the great thing about telecommunications is that for the most part it's about what works, right? We, we need a, a, a better network, we need more connectivity. Uh, we need to make room for 5G. We need to uh, make sure that in the next uh, iteration of a spectrum auction uh, that we make uh, room for unlicensed spectrum. Uh, we understand that in the implementation of the last spectrum auction that we're going to have uh, uh, challenges with siting. So there are some kind of technical, pragmatic, technocratic issues uh, on which we can agree uh, across party lines. So my, my chairman of the subcommittee is Roger Wicker, you know, the chairman of the National Republican Senate Committee. And we scarcely disagree on anything when it comes to telecommunications, which, which uh, I mean, there are a couple of notable exceptions, which I, I won't have to tell you which ones they are. But when it comes to rural broadband, uh, when it comes to the BTOP program, uh, when it comes to FirstNet, uh, the Commerce Committee and the Telecommunications Subcommittee in particular is a sort of oasis of not just bipartisanship, but really nonpartisanship. Uh, and uh, because it's about what's going to work in the marketplace. And for the, for the most part, you know, you do have your ideologues on either side, but for the most part, uh, there are very few people who think the government has no role. And there are very few people who think the government should be overly aggressive and stop the innovation that's occurring. The question is sort of where everybody sort of lands on that spectrum. So my view is that the Commerce Committee uh, can be one of the few places, maybe also with the Appropriations Committee, uh, where we just do pragmatic things and, and get the job done. Yeah, and it sounds like you, there are a lot of places for compromise, but there are also, like you said, some policy fights ahead. Um, what do you think the temperature is among Senate Democrats in terms of how aggressively they'll fight on tech policy issues, net neutrality being, I think, the foremost in everyone's mind? Well, I won't speak for, for uh, for you know, all Senate Democrats on, on net neutrality, I'll, I'll say it this way, however. Uh, you know, I am a person who has always said that the Commerce Committee is the place to make public policy as it relates to these issues. And that to the extent that there is irritation, right, with the FCC or the FTC because they are um, contravening what we think they should do, there is a remedy for that, and it's called exercising our constitutional responsibilities to make public policy. And what I want to do, because I know, especially in, in the United States Senate, that the door swings both ways, I'll uh, 
you know, being the minority and the majority uh, probably numerous times uh, during my career, uh, is to stay consistent on that even when it's inconvenient, right? So I think we should legislate in the area of net neutrality. On the other hand, uh, right now, it's too polarized, right? The idea of just enshrining uh, 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 no blocking, no paid prioritization, and all the original tenets of, of net neutrality in the statute and leaving the FCC with all of its existing authorities, we're just not there. Uh, so that's sort of legislating. Uh, so I'd be open to legislating, but only if it were in good faith and not a sort of a Trojan horse for an attempt to undermine the authorities that the agency has. That's one sort of part of this. The other part of this is, as we know, there's litigation pending, and all of that will take time. But the, the, you know, even when you take a new administration, and even Commissioner Pai, who has a totally different view than, than Commissioner Wheeler on net neutrality, uh, you understand, all of you understand, that reversing the open internet order is not so easy. It takes time. It's basically a whole new rulemaking, and it can be challenged, and that can all take time. So my own view is that for the sake of clarity, we should just be making public policy. Um, but we're not there yet uh, because it has become an article of faith among uh, some on the right that, you know, this is Obamacare for the Internet, right? Uh, and it has become an article of faith on the left that even though the original tenet was net neutrality, right, that the legal strategy, the tactical approach of the FCC became Title II, which I didn't object to, I still support, but now the question is, is it Obamacare for the Internet or is it Title II? And now both sides are dug in uh, totally. And my hope and my, my uh, expectation is that eventually people will come down from their perches and realize that continuing to litigate this battle um, prevents us from being able to solve problems which are you know, more right in front of us, um, having to do with strengthening our network, uh, freeing up uh, uh, spectrum and making the system work better overall. I guess, how do you get people, if they're so far apart, um, what, what does the process look like for getting people to come together to move away from those perches? Well, I think, um, uh, you know, some of this has to just be metabolized, right? Some of the, you know, the, the, nobody's going to give up on the prospect of just a total victory, right? Uh, but I don't, you know, in politics, there's no such thing as a total political victory, right? Somebody always emerges from the ashes and comes back to get you. And so, both sides, right? <laughs> both, really, both sides. And so, that it, it, so it's important to remember that it, to the extent that industry wants to be, you know, wants rules of the road, wants consistency, right? Reliability, predictability. Right? Your CEOs, many of you are you know, senior people in your companies, you'll say, let us know what these rules are going to be and we can work with almost anything. As long as we know that they're going to stick for 5, 10, 15 years. So if you want that kind of policy certainty, then you have to be in a policy conversation as opposed to just trying to vanquish the other side. Uh, and so um, I'll say we have a good start uh, in terms of leadership with John Thune and, and Bill Nelson. I mean, these are... Uh, chair and ranking member in the, in the model of the old Commerce Committee uh, when it worked better, right? That there, there is a true partnership and that there are some times where there are necessary divisions either based on ideology or whatever it may be. But for the, more, for the most part, and I mean 95% of the time, those two individuals lead the committee and set the example for the committee to sort of behave. And um, that's, I think, where it starts. It does start with personalities and, and leadership. Well, there were a couple of um, bipartisan bills, including Mobile Now, that kind of were put on hold in some of the uh, back and forth over Commissioner um, Jessica Rosenbruchel's nom renomination. You've supported her renomination in the past. Do you continue to support it? Do you think she's the right choice for the FCC? And how do you see that as becoming an issue again? Well, first of all, I, I absolutely support Jessica. I think she's an extraordinary public servant. She had uh, lots and lots of experience, not, not only on, on the committee, but uh, in the commission. And what was done to her uh, was unusually mean-spirited. Um, and so she ought to be back on the FCC. Uh, that having been said, I think there's room for negotiation around 
commissioners and the FCC and walling that off from a legislative conversation. Um, going forward, um, we sort of have to press a reset button and look at Mobile Now and look at the Digit Act and look at um, uh, USF issues and, and try to find opportunities where we can collaborate and have our battles over here, but still understanding that um, you know, we've we got to make things work in the meantime. Yeah. I was hoping you could tell us a little bit about uh, the Digit Act. Um, Particularly with technology moving so quickly, it seems like it can be difficult for policy to, to catch up. How does, how does that bill address that challenge? Well, I mean, it, it, so, so you all know that, that IoT is, is changing everything. And the challenge that I see is that everybody in the private sector has an instinct to be totally left alone uh, and, and have us do no harm. And that's a perfectly reasonable instinct as we often do harm. Uh, on the other hand, um, there's a point at which an old statutory infrastructure that was literally written before any of this became even a twinkle in anyone's eye uh, becomes to weigh down the possibility of innovation. And so, um, you know, take FinTech or take HIPAA or, and, and suddenly all of these devices, right, or excuse me, all of these services and softwares are merged into one device. Now, so talk to your general counsel. Are you guys under HIPAA? Are you under, you know, the Securities and Exchange Commission? You know, uh, what is the statutory infrastructure for the enterprise uh, that, that, you're, that you're operating? And my own view is that there's a point at which even those with a very strong instinct against government sort of interfering that we're going to have to have some rules of the road. And um, I think IoT is one of those spaces. Uh, and I also think we have to have some, some uh, you know, difficult, not necessarily contentious, but some challenging conversations related uh, to what are we gonna do about AI as it relates to law enforcement, right? What are we going to do about the uh, ability for a consumer to make choices, right? It's one thing to say, hey, by the way, you can stick this thing on your wrist and it'll monitor all kinds of interesting things regard, regarding your health and that will uh, empower you to become more healthy. That seems like a, I, I get to choose whether to put something on, their, on, their, on, on one's wrist. Hey, you know what? This car seat actually monitors your heart rate to make sure um, that uh, you know, you're not having a heart attack and it'll slow down your car or whatever it may be. What happens when every single car comes equipped with one of those things? Do I get a choice? Is there a point at which a consumer has to opt out of having an online home, right? And to the extent that the sort of legal framework, right, for um, consumer choice becomes, I understand, in exchange for a certain commercial service, a software or a thing or whatever it is, that I'm waiving certain sort of theoretical privacy rights, right? But what happens when that choice, as a practical matter, doesn't even exist because my insurance company, my electric utility, uh, my toothbrush, it, uh, seriously, requires that I click agree to sort of participate in life, right? And I don't think this is like apocryphal sci-fi stuff. I think we're talking about maybe five, maybe 15 years from now, where there's an, it is an open question, right? Whether the constitutional rights that I have to privacy have any relevance to my life if basically I'm clicking I agree everywhere I go in order to function in this society. Now, I don't think that causes me to say we need a statutory right to privacy or all of you should be regulated. I'm just saying we have to have this conversation. And part of the solution, in my view, has to be private sector driven because consumers ought to be empowered to make these decisions. And as everybody is trying to make everything smarter and more efficient and more integrated, uh, we have to always think about giving the opportunity to every single consumer to choose whether or not to participate, right? And efficiency, integration, all of that is extremely exciting, um, but there is an open question as to whether or not um, at some point we have to devote some of our intellectual capacity, devote some of our financial resources, our public policy you know, throughput 
to the question of, well, what about the consumers who may have a concern here, right? And not treat them like they're sort of, um, you know, standing on a soapbox outside a Revolution bookstore. Uh, this is a real issue and it has to be contended with. And I'm not necessarily saying it has to be dealt with in the public policy context, but I will say that if there is no private sector solution set, that eventually there will be a public policy solution set. And I think um, we have to have that uncomfortable conversation. As exciting as it is to just go and do, you know, tech expos and wear cool things and understand cool devices, there are people out there who want to understand that they're still in control of their person, which includes their data. Well, let's um, talk a little bit about President Trump's choice for Commerce Sec mm. Secretary. Um, you had a hearing last week. First of all, do you support that nomination? I didn't intend to make news today, but yes. <laughs> um, uh, I, I found him to be um, uh, uh, just an extremely pragmatic, uh, diplomatic uh, uh, person who understands the mission of the Commerce Department. One of the concerns that I have, you know, you, you, you get a person who's been very successful in business and they're being asked to run the Commerce Department, but do they really understand that, for instance, 60% of the Commerce Department is the NOAA budget, right? And that matters very much to me. Actually, it should matter to everybody because satellite data is a non-trivial thing in terms of aviation, tourism, agriculture, transportation, and everything else. And so we had a very good conversation about the NOAA budget. We had a very good conversation about the census. He was actually a census taker uh, in college. And I was very impressed with, with his um, uh, even keeled demeanor uh, of his knowledge of certainly the private sector, but also his willingness to uh, better understand the agency. And you know, for, for me, one of the bright lines in terms of whether I'll support certain nominees or not is whether they support the mission of the agency, right? Uh, I voted for General Mattis for that reason. I'll vote for uh, I'll vote against Scott Pruitt for that reason. Uh, my view is that whatever party you belong to, you should not be put in charge of an agency um, in a case where you disagree with its basic mission. And, and in this instance, um, I think uh, Secretary nominee Ross uh, uh, meets my standard. Well, one of the things he talked about was that uh, broadband should be a part of any infrastructure plan. Um, what would you like to see out of Congress this year in terms of supporting broadband deployment? Well, I think that's exactly right. And I, you know, I didn't quite know how much enthusiasm there is among, uh, uh, you know, pre-rock rib Republicans for broadband infrastructure. But, you know, it's that Cochran and it's, it's, uh, it's Roger Wicker and it's John Thune. And they understand how essential broadband infrastructure is uh, for their communities. And we have the same issues that, you know, in the state of Hawaii, we're the most isolated, uh, populated place uh, on the planet. You know, we've got uh, over a million and a half people. Our topography is extraordinarily difficult. We do have one of the densest cities in the nation, but we also have extraordinarily sort of far-flung uh, rural uh, uh, neighborhoods, and they all need broadband infrastructure. So that's a space where I think we can get uh, bipartisan cooperation, whether it's through an infrastructure bill or through a separate vehicle, uh, through the Commerce Committee, I think remains to be seen. Okay. I think I have time for one more question. So I guess I want to ask, uh, what's one piece of legislation that you think you can get done this year that would have the most impact in this space? Uh, I think, uh, you know, the more we can do in the broadband space, the better. And, you know, I, my sort of political philosophy as it relates to the Senate itself is, you know, you can score a lot of runs hitting signals. And uh, my own view of the last eight or so years is that what the Congress tried to do is take little difficult things and pile them on top of other little difficult things and then try to pile them on top of really tough things and try to create a grand bargain. And we, we just obviously are not very good at the grand bargain. And my own view is that the Senate is supposed to be a place where you make incremental progress, but even the little things in the Senate are enormously important. You know, my predecessor, Danny Noy, had, had, a, had a rule, and it was, it was called his 40% rule. He said, every year you ask for everything you want, and if you get 40%, then by the third year you're getting more than you ever asked for. Now, my rule should be discounted significantly from 40% um, because I'm not Dan, but, um, but I think the point is, is the right one, which is to understand that 
uh, where the Congress has been inflicting harm, not just on the government and public servants, but on the private sector, is when we uh, overreach, uh, not just in the regulatory sense, but we, we, we have a lack of understanding and humility about what we're capable of, of, of doing together. And so what I try to do is find areas for bipartisan compromise and build on that. Because what happens is success breeds success. A committee that's functioning tends to function better and better and better. And you build momentum, and, and even members on the, on the conservative side of the aisle who sort of came to prevent legislation from passing uh, start to understand that legislating is more fun, more rewarding, both for your constituents and as a personal matter, uh, than stopping everything. And so I think John Thune takes that approach. And I think the first place to start is broadband, because there's basically nobody that disagrees with it. All right. Thank you very much.